We had brought a principal to a large venue in Las Vegas for a UFC fight. Kind of all hell broke loose at this fight. Thousands and thousands of people. We had to get this person who was very close to the ring out of there very quickly. You, that's why planning is so very important. But that's somebody I gotta have my eye on. What do you look for? First thing, obviously, anyone who you do have a goal look for, be on the lookout. You have information on someone, you're always scanning for them. If they show up at an event, that's a problem. You have to address immediately. Wherever you are, you should have a heightened sense of awareness with those people because they're they're erratic and you're not sure what might happen. Communication skills, handle the stress, think quick and mitigate. Do the best you can to accommodate the principle. Most of this job is communications and understanding how to handle people, good judgment calls, so much more than firearms proficiency and mixed martial arts. It really, communications and good judgment is the most important weapons we have. We don't stay and fight. That's not what we do. So if someone pulls a gun, we get that principal in the vehicle and we're out of there as fast as possible. We don't care about the aftermath. Our job is to get that principal out there, not stay and have a firefight. So my guest today is a bodyguard, and I'm not talking about Kevin Costner from the movie Bodyguard with Whitney Houston. I'm talking about real-life bodyguard, a certified bodyguard. He runs a company. He's a CEO of Global Threat Solution, a retired Army intelligence officer, United States Army captain, and he's a bodyguard to celebrities, presidents, politicians, all walks of life. With that being said, Kenneth Bombas, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for having me on your show. I'm really looking forward to this. So so I'm curious. So, you know, kids grow up. We say, oh, I want to be a baseball. I want to be the next Mickey Mantle. I want to be the next Jeter. I want to be the next this. I want to be LeBron, Kobe, Jordan. Who wakes up and says, you know, Dad, Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a bodyguard. Well, to answer that question, uh, I didn't wake up and say that. I, uh, You know, since I was five years old, I consider myself very lucky that I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go in the military, wanted to go into law enforcement, wanted to be a police officer. And I've done both of those. So it was uh, during those careers that led me to creating my own company and and operating as a protection firm. You know, uh, uh, primarily at the end of my law enforcement career, last six years, I led protection operations for one of the largest police departments in America. And that's what kind of led me to think that I really enjoyed the work. It was it's challenging. It's a lot of, uh, it's definitely a, a thinking man's game. And I enjoyed the work, got a great deal of experience. They sent me to a, a ton of great training. I've been trained by some of the, uh, by Blackwater. I've been trained by Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I've created a program to train people through the police department. And uh, I enjoyed the work. And then I also, when I retired, I was uh, 45 years old. And I saw the opportunity of starting my own firm to do this type of work. And that's what I've done. So, so in the, in the, you know, position of being a bodyguard, going back to yourself saying you always knew you were going to be a cop or you were going to go into military law enforcement. Did you have a, were your parents in it? Was an uncle, was a grandfather? Was it like you looked up to your father so much? We're like, one day I want to be a cop. Uh, so partially my father was in the air force. He wasn't in law enforcement. He was an air traffic controller his whole career. Uh, and did that for many years, went into leadership. But ever since I was young, uh, I was I was taught, uh, I guess, mostly by observation, my parents, I'll tell you, probably more so than my father, who was a great patriot, was my, my mother, who is an incredible patriot. And she's, me and her see eye to eye to this day, and she's in her 80s. And uh, I knew that I wanted to go into military since I was five. And I knew that I wanted to go become a police officer. And I'll just say that the two go sort of hand in hand. Uh, A lot of people who go into the military end up transitioning into law enforcement. If you look at any police department, a large one, I know when uh, in our department at the time, we had over 2,600 officers, over 600 of them were veterans. So it's, it's a the wow. two careers, it lends itself to a career in law enforcement, the camaraderie, the type of work, you know? So I knew both, though, that I wanted to do both of those since I was very young. Five years old. Were you, are you an older brother? Uh, no, I'm actually the youngest of five children. Get out of here. Yeah, the youngest. So how is the youngest protective? Because to do what you want to do, you got to have a protective DNA. Were you always the guy that kind of protect, you wanted to protect people? Was that part of your DNA? I, I love the idea of it. Since as long as I can remember, I think that's what probably 
um, the attraction to the military. You know, was was a defending people, protecting people that couldn't protect themselves. The same thing with law enforcement. Ever since I was young, I guess you know, I grew up in the seventies. I would watch movies, war movies. I'd watch Dirty Harry was my my favorite movie. Probably still is all of them. And I'm I'm just turned fifty years old this year, so uh, you know, it was a culmination of things. But I would say that that uh, I knew I wanted to be in the military, law enforcement was just, it goes hand in hand. The two work together. And uh, it's great that I've been able to do both in a parallel career. I initially, of course, at 18, the day after high school, I went in the military. I, I joined when I was 17, as soon as I was allowed to to join. And, uh, you know, I served in the military, military, and then that transitioned into eventually a, a law enforcement career with a parallel reserve forces military career. Got it. Got it. Uh, and, and your your siblings, did they ever go in the military or no? Were they any any one of them law enforcement or military? No, no, it was just so me. You're the only one. Yeah. Got it. Interesting. Okay. So, so then, uh, by the way, back in the days when I left the army, the first thing I got a job offer. This is what's funny. I got a job offer for $28,800 a year at Fort Lauderdale Police Department to be a cop, right? But I live in California and I was in, uh, Kentucky at the time. I'm like, I don't even know where Fort Lauderdale is now. You know, I'm 20 miles away from Fort Lauderdale today. Then when I went back, my dad said, Patrick, you know, people like you who are big and intimidating, you need to go be a cop, you know, was his Tony Robbins speech, you know, you need to go be a cop. So I went and applied to, I was 21 years old. I applied to be LAPD. Uh, I passed obviously uh, the stuff that you need to pass, but they don't like 16 speeding tickets. So that that was what hurt me from being a cop or else I would have also been a cop. But you're right. Military typically leads to going into that side, firefighter. You know, there's some areas because you get that additional 10 points that they give you. I don't know what it was. It was a certain right. 10 you get for the test that you take. Anyways, let's transition to being a bodyguard. So, you know, you've been in this space of bodyguard. Uh, uh, you know, it's your business. It's what you do, protection. What are... If you notice a trend, especially today, who are you noticing calling you, telling you, hey, I need protection? Are you noticing a trend with industries? Are you noticing a trend with, you know, a certain level of success? Are you noticing a trend or is it all over the place? There's not like 48% of our clients that make a call to us. They're from et cetera, et cetera. What are you noticing on who's giving you a call, meaning your ideal customer that calls you? So, right. I'll tell you, it's, uh, you always have celebrities. They always have protection, mostly, especially, you know, your A-list celebrities will have uh, bodyguards. By the way, we, we call it executive protection, close protection. Bodyguard in our industry is almost kind of looked down upon the term because it's it gives an image of maybe like almost like a bouncer. You know what I mean? You have someone who's like 300 pounds and stands at the door. And like I mentioned before, protection operations, it's so much more than that, so much logistics and so much... Uh, um, training and planning to go into it. But to get back to your question, I'll tell you that it's celebrities, definitely uh, corporate. That's big. So the way this works nowadays is a lot of uh, corporations, once they, they go public, a lot of times right in the bylaws for those companies, they put in there that these certain positions will have protection. And it's uh, it's sort of works well for the executives because it takes the responsibility, you know, having it a big expensive security detail could be a liability as a business person. Politicians too. Um, so what this does is these companies are saying, listen, you're in, say for a, a C-suite member, you're the CEO of a big company. They'll say, you're an asset. You don't have a choice. You're getting this protection services. Where anyone in that position gets it. Got it. So once you take that position, you have a, a, an executive protection driver, you have residential security, many of them, when I say executive protection, it's not just taking them out from morning to their home for the evening of 24 hour residential protection, too. So you look at a lot of big companies, tech firms that I'm not going to give names, but people would be so surprised because it really is a niche um, industry. Who has these? They'd be like, well, who gets these services? Well, any big company you look at who has a C-suite and I'll say large company, you know, companies definitely. Um, uh, 500 million and, and higher, probably, if I were to throw a number on it, um, they're going to have some type of protection for their C-suite or uh, senior executives. 
And it, you know, it's not, doesn't necessarily um, relate to a direct threat level, you know, like obviously a high profile person is going to have uh, executive protection. Some of the famous tech firm CEOs, everybody knows, right? Um, but also companies that you wouldn't even know who the CEO is, still large companies, but they're just not that high profile. Um, they have it as well. And so corporate accounts are big in this industry. They will hire, they will often subcontract companies to provide services for them. Uh, and then celebrities is another one. And uh, people of high net worth family offices, they will also hire uh, companies like mine to provide those services. Very interesting. And it does make sense. So it's not really by choice sometimes if it's in if you're a CEO or high C-suite executive of a $40 billion company, they're going to say, look, John, you know, this is, you don't have a choice. You got to have somebody, we're hiring somebody that's going to protect you because now you're an asset to the company. The board wants you to be protected. Okay, check. So that's one. Celebrities will typically call and say, hey, we're going here. Their team's going to call and say they're going to need somebody. Fine, check. That makes sense. Residential, you mean there are instances where you are pretty much with the client 24-7? There are those instances as well? That's right. 24 hours a day. You know, that's a big vulnerability, especially when you have someone who is very high profile. We've all heard the stories, especially with celebrities. Somebody could come on your property. You can find it where anybody lives these days. Right. No matter who you are. And uh, they'll have 24 hour residential protection. It, I'll be honest, for someone who has a full executive protection detail or a protection detail, um, more than not, they're going to have residential protection, too. They're going to have someone there 24 hours a day. Uh, 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 Kenneth, what's a what's a full time 24 7 30 365? What does that cost a client if they want 24 7 residential protection all year long? What does that cost per year? Uh, per year, I'd have to break that down. It depends on so many variables. How many agents do you have in a detail? What is it typically? Um, so if you want to say well, ideally, typically it's two or three. What, what you break two it down? Or three, but remember, then you might have 24 hour coverage. Not one agent works seven days a week. And, you know, you're talking 24 hour billing, you have millions, you know, definitely a few million dollars you're going to have for someone to have year long coverage. It would start at that level, maybe two, three million dollars. Someone's going to have 24 hour residential wow. protection and a protection detail where they'd have a driver and an agent. You know, all are different. Some people might just have one person, but you really, you know, um, let's talk, let's talk about moving your, we call it a principal. You're driving them around, right? If you're the driver, sometimes they say, no, no, we just need one. If you're the EP driver, we call it executive protection driver, and you're armed, you can't just jump out of that car and go in places with them. You can't es escort them in places. So it's a big vulnerability. So oftentimes you'll have a driver and then you'll also have your, your lead agent. That'll be a person sitting maybe in the passenger seat who's going to exit a vehicle and they're going to accompany that principal wherever they go. But by the way, it's always dictated by the principal. People like to, you know, you watch a lot of TV, a lot of movies, and people have this idea where um, um, they, a agent will say, no, sorry, sir, we're not doing that because there's a risk. It, you could got, you could advise them any way you want, but ultimately the principal is going to make that decision. And I'll be honest with you, that's all the way up to the president. You know, um, yes, does it, did the Secret Service not want President Obama to, to suddenly say, hey, pull over, I want to go into this hamburger place in Washington, D.C.? Of course they said they'd rather him not do that. Did he do it? Yes. So, you know, ultimately the principals will make those decisions. All you can do is advise them the best you can, and then you mitigate. Okay, he's going to do it. Let's take steps to mitigate any threats that might be there. That's how it works. They ultimately do call the shots. So full-time, 24-7, residential protection. If these guys got to get their sleep, so if you're doing 24-7, eight hours, so it's like a rotation. Is a rotation of three different uh, – uh, 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 we, well, that depends too. So there's a couple of ways we bill in this industry. Sometimes we do a daily flat rate, which we'll, we'll put a limit on that. That would be an agent from morning to when they're in for the evening. And we bill them a daily flat rate because you have to make sure that that agent's being paid according to the laws of the state they're in. California, as I'm sure you're aware, I've run details out there. It could be expensive. Um, because, you know, you have agents, anything over eight hours and then 12 hours, they're going to make overtime. And you have to accommodate for that. So we use, we like to, when possible, you don't want a lot of turnover. 
eight hour shifts are too short uh, for two reasons. First of all, um, it's easier for staffing and scheduling to have an agent 12 hours sh- do 12 hour shifts. Also, your principal, they don't like a lot of turnover. I haven't run a detail yet where they don't say, listen, I, every time I go outside, I see a new face. Got they want to they want to get comfortable with the people that protecting them. So you're never going to be able to do it with one, but you're going to try and limit that number of agents you use for a detail. So it's a balancing act. You know, you want it to be efficient, economical, but you also yeah. don't want to have every time they walk outside, there's somebody new. You know, it's interesting. Last year, uh, well, not last year, 2019, when it was still open, we had our event at the Mirage. And I invited the the late Kobe Bryant and uh, President Bush. So when President Bush came, you know, they have to call and say, hey, he's coming, he's speaking. Secret Service showed up. Everybody gets that yellow. You know what I'm talking about, that little stick. And so there was a first time where the board said, we need somebody around you full time, right? So they had somebody, I'm the CEO of the company. So we had 7,000 people there. Convention, you never know. People are walking, competitors, et cetera. So... It was amazing that when the executive protection firm, obviously you, you mentioned Blackwater earlier, that's Prince, and he runs a, I don't know, multi-billion dollar company. It's a very big operation. I think uh, one of my associates, Chris Peranto, I did some projects for him, but that was overseas. And also some people that just use that company for different kinds of uh, um, services. When the executive protection uh, uh, guy came in and he was uh, with me, when they change it the first day, I said, no, I want the same guy. So they brought the same guy. Well, the fee is going to be a little bit higher if you want that. I, don't, I, won't, I want that guy. There was a level of comfort with them that uh, we brought him in. And we brought him in. I said, listen, my wife and I are having breakfast. He was standing at the door. I said, do you mind just joining us? He says, I can't. I said, just can you like, he says, well, I got to do my job. I said, if you want to eat something, he says. So it was, it was good talking, making some kind of a con- connection to know what his background was. But it wasn't cheap on what we paid. And I remember that. What is the daily rate right now? If you were to say ball, you know, ballpark, high, low, give me the high, low numbers. I know you said California, so it varies by state. Give me high, low. So I've built, I like to consider myself a, uh, um, a, a, a company with fair rates. Um, so I build as low as we'll do a thousand dollar daily flat rate for an agent. Of course, that's in addition to expenses or anything you might have to provide if they need a vehicle, if uh, there's lodging involved for the agents, travel, things like that. Um, but we, I've billed more than that, depending on the detail. And there's other companies that bill far more than that, $2,000 a day, you know, they'll bill or more for an agent. So, you know, but we're in the business to be fair. We, we want to make sure we pay our people well. That's the, the main thing. So that, you know, the, really, honestly, the way we run our companies, our profit margin comes secondary. We have to make sure the agents get taken care of. And I'll tell you another thing that is becoming more and more important to companies that contract you. They want to know. They just don't want to know what your billing rate is. You'll say, especially some of the really big high profile companies, social media companies, they'll say, that's great what you're billing us. What are you paying your people? Are you giving them health insurance? They want to know. They want to know that you're taking care of their pe- your people because that reflects on them too. Because they're, yes, it's a contract, but it's working for their firm. So, uh, so we, the first thing is that. And then, you know, you just want to make sure you have a profit uh, margin in there that's fair for you and the client. And that's what we try and do. I'll tell you, we're, we're definitely, I'd say, below average in the billing rate for, for some companies. Plus, you'll have companies that'll, for lack of a better word, gouge. You know, when you go in and do an initial assessment, they'll say, well, you need this many agents and you should have someone here and someone here. Yeah. When you do one of these assessments, you should be giving them the most cost effective and um, efficient option you can that still provides them the appropriate level of attack, uh, protection. It's very easy to say, well, let's do 10 agents because <laughs> they know it's billable hours, right? It's like attorneys. They know they're looking at, at math rather than what this person really needs. So when you're saying millions of dollars for executive protection 24-7, how many agents are you calculating that would need to run that? Because I did the math. I'm like, okay, 168 hours. Is there a limit on how many hours an agent can work? Is it a 40-hour limit that you have that an agent can work per week, or is it 50, 60? What number do you guys go based on? It depends on the state you're working in. Um, Also, if someone's sometimes you use an independent contractor. Maybe they have their own LLC. So I'm billing them. uh, You don't have a limit for hours with that. And then it changes everything. They're no longer an employee, right? Yeah, but when they're working as an employee, it depends on the state. But for the most part, 40 hours is what you're limited. Not 
let me rephrase that, not limited to, but you're going to be paying overtime over that. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, and, so, and that just goes by the state. So so if if we were to do the math, I got my phone in front of me. So if, I, if I'm doing 24-7 protection, does an average family only have one guy working at a time or do they typically like two at a time? Because it's not going to be a small house. They're not living at a small house. So it's probably going to be a place where you need eyeballs, different places. Do they typically ask for one right. full or a two? It's, you know, it's a difficult question, but I would say two would be an average right. probably. on a, You're talking an overnight residential. Yes, yes. yes. So, you know, uh, overnight residential. Two would probably be an average. Some have many more. Some will just have one. And then for detail during the day. Now, remember this. They're going to have that during the day, too. Even mm -hmm. when that executive protection detail is traveling with that principal, bringing them to work or events or wherever they have to go, you're still going to have that 24-hour protection at the residence, even when they're traveling. They're somewhere else. That makes sense. Because there's a vulnerability there, right? So now it's almost like you have two separate details. It's exactly what it's like. You have your residential protection agents, and then you have your executive protection agents. You can see how it adds up quickly. And that's um, millions. You're saying that's that's a two oh, to four yeah, million yeah. dollar bill per year. Yeah, we we had a client in California as an example. Um, two principals we were protecting, two residences, and uh, they had a driver and an agent with them. And I could tell you it was between three and four million dollars we were billing a year gross. Three to four million dollars. And in what okay, so three and that's not a that's not that a that was only uh, one residential agent at a time. And that's not a public, like that's not a politician you're talking about. That's no, a no, that's a business private business. Right. So I'll be honest with you, most politicians, they're almost all, they have government protection. They're not going to have their own uh, security. When it would come into place is if someone leaves office and they no longer have security, right? Um, say like, like a vice president. I've done, I've done a, a de I was contracted my firm to provide security during Democratic presidential forums leading up to the election. All over the country, we did them. And uh, one of the candidates, as we now know, is the current president, um, President Biden. He would attend these. And he would have uh, he would have a private security with him. He no longer had the Secret Service protection. So in that scenario, maybe. But when you're talking about anyone from like a county executive or a mayor or a governor, um, they have they have police providing their security, executive protection, like I did when I was a detective. And I've worked with I've worked with uh, law enforcement members from uh, uh, so many different governors and mayors details. We would all, you know, you would all interact because politicians interact, right? So uh, you, you would come across these different details. And then it's funny because I've also run into some of them who like me have transitioned into the private sector doing the same thing. Got it. So, so let me, let me ask you this uh, question. I, I, I don't know how you would answer this. I've had Clint Hill on and uh, Clint Hill uh, uh, was uh, uh, Secret Service for Jackie Kennedy and four other presidents. So he has a lot of stories. So, you know, they typically say, like, if you go to the DMV and you don't like the way they handle, you're getting a new license registration, no one is really going to give you any kind of customer service. You go post a review on Yelp, no one cares. It's not like it's going to make it up to the president. Why did you mistreat a customer that came in, right? Versus you go to a restaurant and you're like, hey, Mary, the hostess, gave an attitude to my wife and my kids. I didn't like it. Hey, Mary, we have to have a conversation. What's this about, right? So there's a little bit more accountability. Who's better at executive protection, secret service or private, you know, uh, executive protection companies that you go through? So listen, uh, I work closely with the secret service. It wasn't a secret service agent. I was a detective and they have their, uh, like a partnership program. It's like a liaison program. So when they go to do security, uh, like they would do in the Hamptons in Long Island when I was working, they had to work with police. We provided resources. They didn't have boats, helicopters, highway patrol, lots of bodies to do security, right? So I work closely with them. They're great at what they do. They are the worldwide premier protection agency, right? Everybody kind of respects them as that. But I'll tell you, it's also very different. They have a lot of resources all the time and authority to do that you don't have in the private sector. We're not shutting down Express the Long Island Expressway for, with my company, but I did it when we were working with the Secret Service. They have benefits like that. They could bring in agents from all the different states to work a big event. 
So, so it, you know, it's a, that's an impossible question. Many of the people I've worked with in the private sector were Secret Service agents. They, that's what they did, you know, and who come into my line of work. So then that means they would be, though, right? The, the guys who were former Secret Service guys, because they're bringing that training yes. and they're bringing what they learn in the public. So if it's a former Secret Service guy that's also working in the public, so he's going to have a multidimensional experience than somebody that just was Secret Service. Oh, of course. Yeah. So that's what I would say. They, you know, the two are definitely different. There's not a secret service agent that would tell you that doing private sector uh, security and doing government work like that, very different, but they come with an incredible skill set and an experience level. They know how it works. They get to, you know, executive protection is a customer service based business. I always like to say when we're training our agents, we do get bags, you know, that whole attitude where it would be like, no, I'm here for security. That's not the way this works. You know, these are clients of ours. We're here to help them and, and whatever they do within reason. You know, we're not going to have people doing ridiculous things so that security is jeopardized, but we're here to work for the client. And the Secret Service really gets that. They've, they work in that same type of a manner with all of their principles they've, they've worked with. And, and uh, I would say that they have a great afterlife because, you know, the, the name Secret Service agent goes a long way in the corporate world, you know, or not just for executive protection, but becoming security directors and working in corporate security. People like that, that title, you know, that they bring with them on their resume. Do some of these guys come out and they say, you know, I'd love to just land a family and they go live with the family. They, they get uh, closer to a family and the family pays them, I don't know, $150,000, $250,000, $300,000 a year. And they're just like, look, kind of like, you know, how somebody has a nanny or your home, your, whatever you want to call it. They get a place in the back and you're getting paid a quarter million. Just make sure our family is protected. When we travel, you go with us. Is there those types of relationship as well for some of these folks? Of course. Oh, okay. I've heard everything, the full spectrum. You know, you have people that might just be per diem agents protecting someone when they come to visit New York or Las Vegas or L.A., and then you have people that um, they bring in a relationship is very important. If they like you mentioned earlier, if they have someone they really like and like like you said, you like the agent, I'd like that one to work tomorrow. That people will pay um, top dollar and they'll make accommodations for them. I've heard everything from a, a, an executive protection agent in the private sector. There was someone a high net, very high net worth who allowed him to use his cars. I mean, Ferraris and things when. <laughs> When he was off off duty, not working. I mean, uh, listen, of course. In the private sector. That's what's nice about it is um, there, there's no you know you don't have the strict adherence to rules that you have in the government work, right? People these they are the boss, they are the principal, and a lot of these people have tremendous resources themselves. And if they really like someone, you know, it's a fine line you have to tread, but they'll bring them almost in. They want them almost sort of like a member of their family because they're going to be around their children, they're going to be around their family. They're going to see them at their most intimate moments all the time. So they want someone they're comfortable with. You know, there's just that fine line as someone who runs an executive protection firm that we want them not to cross where they, uh, you know, you don't want an agent that feels if they're working for my company, feels like they're empowered because they have a close relationship with a principal, my client, and they feel like they can call the shots and tell me what's going on. You know, that's a challenge. I think anyone who has a company like mine has for the most part. The people we recruit and train, they get it. They know where their loyalty is, and uh, and they will. Um, they they know how to how to walk that line. Yeah, very very insightful. Because you know you know most 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 of us, all we know is movies. You know when you think about buying, you know movies, you think about executive protection. You think about hey, in that movie with Kevin Costner, in that movie with Liam Neeson, or in that movie. So that's the uh, interpretation we have. And so hey, you know. You know, but but in reality, it's it's slightly different on what happens versus uh, in movies. Uh, uh, let me let me go with a, a, a different angle with you here on on this. This was very helpful. Is it, what what are what are some commonalities amongst executive protection agents that you'll say here's what they're very good at, and what is the priority? Yesterday, I interviewed a sniper, uh, Nicholas Ingram, Nicholas. Irving, he had 33 confirmed uh, uh, kills in Afghanistan in 100 days. And I said, tell me about, you know, what are the trends of uh, snipers? Are they loners? Are they, you know, this? Are they that? And just kind of trying to feel, is there like a trend with that? Because, you know, engineers, if you look at engineers that are coding, they're quiet, they put the headset on, they don't want to be around people, don't bother me. 
you know, let me just kind of get to work and finish my project. So with executive, if you were to say, well, if I was to judge one from the top to bottom, the most important quality is to have a feel for the room. Number two is, you know, being able to protect somebody with firearm. Firearm is more important than actually fighting because we rarely fight. Being able to drive and escape and got to be good in math, got to be good at common sense. How would you say, like, if you were to say, these are the five things we look for for somebody to be very good at what they do? So what I would say is communication skills is top, top tier. It's a, top, a number one priority with an agent that we recruit. You have to be able to communicate with not only the principal, but their staff. We're working with a lot of staffers. Sometimes there are like a right-hand person when we're running these details, you know, they're the one we're coordinating with. So you need to have great communication skills. Also equally as important, you have to be able to handle stress uh, well. If you can't handle stress, this is definitely not the industry for you. Uh, little things, I'm not talking about assassination attempts. I'm talking about making a wrong turn in New York City and your principal has to be at a meeting in 10 minutes. That is real stress, I can tell you. Um, in this business, something that small is critical. Making a wrong turn is devastating. Uh, you know, little things like that, uh, small details can bring a lot of stress. Also, they'll change their plans. You'll have done an advanced site visit to hotels, to meeting venues, all these places. You have their schedule. And then as you're driving, they said, we changed our mind. We want to go to this location now um, in Westchester County from Manhattan and, and changes everything while your agent is sitting in that seat and the driver. You have to be able to react immediately like that and mitigate. Is that perfect? Do I have time to get somebody up to that venue and see it before we get there and arrive? Probably not. You have to be able to think quick, not uh, handle the stress, think quick and mitigate. Do the best you can to accommodate the principal. So stress, communication skills. And also for me, uh, you know, we use law enforcement people and we use military. I I'll be honest, I was both. I love the military people because they have a mission first attitude. I'm the first person to say I've worked in law enforcement for over 20 years. Sometimes a, uh, a union civil service mindset can set in with people and they'll be like, oh, listen, I've been working for 10 hours already. It's got to be mission first. Very interesting what you just said, right? You know, I've had Bernard Carrick on before and we had a great conversation and him and I uh, uh, communicate every once in a while. And it's, it's very interesting how, you know, different it is with military and PD, especially when union gets in and you have to deal with politics and you have certain protection and it's makes your job a little bit tougher. So it's interesting you're saying this. So, so let me ask you this. Does it, what if I'm not a good fighter? What if I don't know how to fight? Does it even no. matter the fact I'm a fighter? Like, do I need to be good at jujitsu, boxing? Cause you know, the Im impression is, oh my gosh, that guy's an exec. He's, he could probably kick my ass. What does that rank in the executive protection priority? So right now you have communication, stress, details, think quick. Where does fighting and right, right. firearms come in handy? So here's what uh, I'll, I'll explain that. First, I'll say this. In, um, in protection services, what we do, there's a thing called getting off the X. We don't stay and fight. That's not what we do. Um, and it's a big retraining process we have to go through, especially for law enforcement. You're a law enforcement officer and you're in the street and somebody pulls a gun, you run towards them. There's going to be a, a blue swarm, right? They're going to tackle that person. They're going to get that gun. In our business, we're, we just get out as fast as we can. Our job is to get off the X, the X wow. being the point of most danger. Please. So if someone pulls a gun, we jump in, the, we get that principal in the vehicle and we're out of there as fast as possible. We don't care about the aftermath. I mean, look, I don't want to sound uncaring, but my point is that's not our job. Will we, of course, relay any information to law enforcement? Of course we would. Our job is to get that principal out there, not stay and have a firefight, not stay and wrestle with someone in the streets. That's not our job. Yeah. So I'll say that first and foremost. With that being said, do you need to be able to protect your principal? Of course. You have to be physically fit. Any martial arts training is always beneficial. If, as far as firearms, I'll, I'll say this. Many, probably the majority I've dealt with in the United States are unarmed details. A lot of corporate executive protection are unarmed. Uh, one reason for that is the crazy gun laws we have in this country. Every state has their own set of laws. 
right. yep. licensing, licensing to carry firearms, license to do security work. Every state needs its own licensing. So it's a, it's a difficult pro, um, requirement to get around. So one thing is a lot of it's unarmed. The other thing is, let's say it is armed, or if you're in a high threat, doing high threat protection, say overseas protection, you're bringing someone maybe to the Middle East um, or someplace in Central or South America, maybe that's a high threat region. Um, then you're going to want someone who has that better, that strong skill set of of uh, firearms proficiency. So when I, I'll be honest with you, when I use armed, the vast majority of the people I use armed in the United States are former law enforcement. You want to know why? Because they come with their training. Wait, they, wait. Can you can you say that one more time? So, so the vast majority of people that I use that are armed are former law enforcement. What what do you mean by that? Domestically. So, in other words, you can have someone who just has a armed security license and a and a firearm, and they've never been a, a, in law enforcement. However, what I what I I would say the majority. I I've hired people like that. The majority I use are former law enforcement when it's an armed detail. First of all, it, it really is beneficial for all the licensing requirements. If they're a former law enforcement officer like myself, I have HR 218. I could carry a firearm anywhere in, in the United States. That's a, 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 a law. A, that we can't do that. Only you can. It's not something available to the public. Uh, that they no, can it's do. not. Right. There's a con I'll, I'll, I'll get off track for a second and say there is a combination of per licensing for a few different states where if you get them, it gives they have reciprocity. You could carry in forty four states. What is, what is it called? It's like California, Utah, and maybe Nevada. There's a couple of states where if you get those, my operations manager knows because we're familiar with it. If you get those licenses, they have reciprocity with other states, and you could carry in forty four states. However, as you would guess, New York doesn't take part in any of those. New Jersey doesn't take part in any of those. California, I'm surprised California's on there. I mean, I remember buying they a gun in California. I had to wait 30 days to get the gun. You know, Texas, you go in, you leave five minutes later. Right, right. So California is one where you have to have the California license. But if you have it in combination with those others, it'll give you 44 states. It's amazing that California yeah. has that. Yeah. Huh. So, Con please continue. I I'm listening. Yeah. So, so what I would say is I like the law enforcement for the armed work. First of all, it's, it's easy because you know, they could carry legally. Secondly, um, they come with their own firearms training. You know, they've done 20 years. Most of the people I use are retired 20 years minimum of annual training. Some of them were in specialized units. They're comfortable carrying a firearm. They it's, they get it. You know, they're, they're, it's, they're um, very comfortable with it. They know where it could go, where it can't and how to use it. So for that, for that specific purpose, law enforcement is often used for armed security work. So, so here's a question for you. What is the worst situation you have been in yourself as an executive protection or one of your agents that reports to you and works for you? What's been a case where, you know, we were in a situation, we're at a restaurant, we were on road, you know, all of a sudden this is what happened and it got ugly very quickly and we had to figure out, obviously you can't disclose a name, but if you could disclose the right. situation you were in, what would you say is the worst situation you've been in? So I'm going to tell, I'll tell you about um, a few of them. Right. One of them was similar to what you just said. We had brought a principal, a corporate principal to a uh, large venue, uh, uh, high occupancy venue in Las Vegas for a UFC fight. And while we were at there doing security and our, our agent was in there with the principal, we had agents waiting outside, uh, kind of all hell broke loose at this fight where we had to get this person who was very close to the ring out of there very quickly. Um, so that's something that could that is a real thing that could happen when you're protecting a principal. And you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of people. You, that's why planning is so very important. You need to know where you have an egress route to get out of that building. Where is your vehicle stage to get them in that vehicle and get them out quickly? That's one of them, an uh, example like that. And we were successful, but it was very chaotic to get them out. Um, another one I had was a, a, large, a very uh, high-ranking corporate executive. I was at a, a venue, a business um, forum, and this person... Uh, who I was protecting personally at the time, because right now I manage a lot of details, but at this time I was the lead agent, um, sort of gave me a look and, and asked, we were in the green room and they asked me to come over um, and they whispered to me, there's a person standing here in the green room um, that is a known 
stalker who's been following me. And now this was not a fault of mine for not recognizing this because it was I was never giving what we call a bola. The, who, who I, the company that hired me never provided me with this information that there was in fact someone who's been following them. Usually if someone, if there's a known entity and often there is high profile business executives, they'll have many people that they keep an eye on. They track because they've made threats. They show up at a lot of their events. It's common. Got it. I was not given that intelligence. Also, the person had legitimate press credentials. So, you know, they were allowed in there. That's another problem you'll find in security these days is that press credentials are easy to get. You could have a blog and somebody will issue you some type of a press credential where you could get pretty close access to people. Um, so that was it was a successful mission. As, as I was told this, the person had took off. She, uh, The uh, person in question, the subject, saw me walking over, talking to the principal and fled. But I had two other agents out in the audience who, through my description and me talking to them in the radio, located the person, followed them back into the forum, We were able to get local law enforcement to show up waiting for them and they walked out. And it was a complete success. The company was very happy with the operation that it turned out that way. That's another example of something that could happen, a real uh, everyday occurrence. Another one was on a personal note. I was uh, contracted by the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, or I should say, I was requested by him. He had not yet been elected. It was a controversial election, uh, T.C. Katie was the, uh, pre- he's the current president a few years, two years ago. Within 24 hours, I had to get, a, I got two agents to accompany me and I flew to the DRC, no weapons. It was a lot of political violence. I think something like over 900 people had been killed in political violence in the country. We went to Kinshasa and uh, I, was con- I was advising the soon to be hopefully elected president because the former president, Kabila, was a dictator for 20 years and there was serious security concerns. So he brought me there to uh, guide him in this during this month or so, the Supreme Court in their country was determining who would be in fact the new president They because they said there was election fraud. In any case, he ended up becoming the president. I was there the night he got sworn in. We were worried about violence, but I would say that that, is, that was a high threat protection detail for sure. We had no weapons um, and uh, you, it was a lot of experience. It's another reason I like the military people for the high threat operations. I had two top tier people, retired a uh, former Marine infantry and a former Green Beret, who within 24 hour notice were with me at the airport with a go bag ready to go to fly to Africa. We landed, we didn't even have a visa. The, pre- the newly elected president, soon to be elected president said, just, just fly over, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And we were detained in a dark room with police. We had a language barrier for a few hours. Well, there's a lot of challenges. Like I said, you have to be able to handle stress well. And I find that the, the military people, the high threat regions, they're the way to go for sure. They're, they, you know, there's nowhere they won't travel and they don't get um, stressed out. They don't, they don't get nervous very easily. Military more than uh, interesting. It, military more than. Uh, oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't bring law enforcement overseas to regions like that. It's all military. It's usually special operations people. Got it. Who who have been deployed, obviously, who have experience being deployed. That's right. Victor, I've never been deployed. Those who have been deployed have experienced what it's like to be deployed. So there's a little bit more uh, right. awareness when a crisis happened and how you responded to it. Even myself, you know, if I had not had the experience in the military and operating in small Iraq, where it was a highly dangerous city, lawless city, it made it much uh, more manageable flying over to the DRC. I bet. And, uh, you know, you know how to handle yourself. Like I said before, most of this job is communications and understanding how to handle people, ju- make good judgment calls, so much more than firearms proficiency and, uh, and, and mixed martial arts. It really, communications and good judgment is the most important weapons we have. So a so qu- question as far as eyeballs on what you're looking at. So say a, 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 a husband and wife, they have three kids. I have three kids, one on the way. We go into a house and we're thinking about, you know, renting this house for Christmas or for whatever. Okay. You know, let's, let's rent this house. I look at the house. And I'm like, okay, nice pool, big theater room. Pretty cool. I like it here. Versus her eyes will look at there's sharp edges on these tables. It's too low. Okay. This step, 
the kids are going to fall over this step because they're going to run and they're going to fall. And so the, the, the eyes are seeing two different things. Same home, same city, same situation, but different lens. When you walk into a place yourself, forget about you, with a client, you're walking into a restaurant because, you know, once you live the life that you live, you can't help but be like that 24 seven because you're wired that way. What are you looking for when you go into a restaurant? What, what things are you looking for when you go out and, you know, you're, you're going out into a place where other people are there? Yeah, so there's two sides to that. First of all, as a law enforcement officer, my whole life, basically, adult life, uh, I go into a restaurant. It's a common joke. My, my family knows to let me sit with my back against the wall so I can see the door. They position themselves. They've been trained since they're little. They know how I, how I operate. Because I want to know if something comes in, I want to be able to address it. I don't like my back being faced to the door. So it's very similar in protection work. When I go in to assess, say I'm going to do an advanced site visit, that's what we call it. The principal is going to be going to a restaurant for a meeting tomorrow night. We go ahead of time. Uh, we're going to check where the exits are. What ex what entrance do we want to bring them in? Depending on your principal, can we bring them in a side entrance or a back entrance so we could avoid crowds? Um, sometimes they won't want that. They're like, no, no, I don't like that. I want to come in like everyone else. They all have different preferences. I've had a principal said, don't hold doors for me. I don't like it. So we didn't hold doors, which is, you know, being raised the way I was, it's a common gesture, right? It's what I do for everybody. Um, but, but you, uh, you have to adjust to your principal. When I'm going into this restaurant, what type of people are here? Is there drinking here? They have cameras in here. Where are the doors, the exits? Is there a room in this place? I could bring this person and use it as a safe room if I had to very quickly, just until we could get help. How, where am I going to position my vehicle? Is there a point of contact? Sometimes when we go there, we'll meet with a manager. Say, listen, I'm going to be bringing someone here tomorrow. In certain area places, they're used to it. They've dealt with it before. And uh, I, hotels, you know, you go to the Four Seasons, they've dealt with protection details. They get it. You know, they know firsthand what you're doing. You're going to, you want to know all of these things. Where can my vehicle be staged? And they'll work with you on that too. They want your principal to come to their place. They want them to have a successful visit to their location. So there's so much that's part of it, a site visit. I do it every time I walk in a place, just, you know, it's ingrained in you. I, I bet. And, and last but not least, before we wrap this up is uh, I'm in sales. So a big part of my business is body language, right? So I need to sit there and say, okay, the wife doesn't trust me yet. Let's see what I can do to break the ice. The husband is disinterested. He has no interest in what I'm talking about right now. How do I gain his interest? You know, I have the two kids over there that are being allowed. The audio of the TV is at 46. I can't sell at 46. What do I need to do to get the kids to calm down? Because mom's already looked back seven times. She's worried. So you're looking at all this stuff. Kitchen table, where do we sit? Do I sit with my back towards where the TV's back there or the TV's back here? You know, do I sit to be on the side of them to feel like we're on this? Everything is a, a bit of psychology when you're selling. And you, when you're around long enough and you lose enough sales and you're broke, you have to improve or you're going to go and not make it, right? So what, what are you looking for? Signs of threat of a, uh, you're looking at somebody and you're saying there's some irregular, you know, it, not normal behavior that guy has got going on. And I'm going to keep my eye on that guy. What, what is he up to? What are some things you look for in somebody that triggers something to say, I'm not saying he's going to do something right now, but that's somebody I got to have my eye on. What do you look for? Right. So there's a few things there. Um, the first thing, obviously, anyone who you do have a bolo for, be on the lookout. You have information on someone, you're always scanning for them. If they show up at an event, that's a problem. You have to address immediately. Um, aside from that, Anyone who would have an unnatural interest in your principal, that's a concern. You're always that's looking. That's the question I'm asking. Here's the question I'm asking. I'm asking not your job. Assume it's the it's me. Like, I don't do what right, you right. Assume a private citizen that's watching this oh, right yeah, now. And yeah. We keep hearing about all this stuff and people are concerned where a parent who has kids, a husband who's trying to protect the wife and the family, or, you know, a mother who's going out that wants to say, okay, maybe it's time we leave. I'm not going to stick around here because that guy's giving me concern. What things, what things can you share with us as the public, not right, you, right. that we can learn from you to say, here's some things to look out for where you may want to behave this way and, and do this. That, that's the question. Yeah. So very similar, very similar to what I would do, right, is what I would explain. One thing is, like I said, anyone who is, uh, anyone, first of all, who's acting irrationally, abnormally, maybe someone who's emotionally disturbed, let's face it, you run into those people all the time in society. It's the way it is. 
um, they're a concern. Wherever you are, you should have a, a heightened sense of awareness with those people because they're they're erratic and you're not sure what might happen. Um, another thing is anyone, like I mentioned, who you notice seems to have an unnatural um, interest, say in your children, when you go someplace or you or yourself, that's of concern. You know, people doesn't necessarily take training. Everyone has training. It's called life, right? You've been around, you, you know, what's normal when it's not. And when something's wrong, your instincts will kick in. You might not even know why, but if someone's acting not, not, not normal or, or naturally, it's really easy to pick up on when you think about it. So anyone who has an unnatural interest in you, your children, family, anyone who's acting abnormally or emotionally disturbed in that sense, those are really what you're looking for. Also, if you had someone, you've always heard this, right? Someone who just doesn't fit in, right? Like somebody who comes in, they seem really nervous. Maybe they're sweating a lot. Maybe they're wearing inappropriate clothing for the climate or the location you're in. That's what picks up my interest. I'll notice it right away. I'm like, that's strange. Why would they do that? I could give you a good example. And anyone could develop these skills. I drive into my neighborhood. I'll come home and I'll walk in my house and I'll tell my wife, did you see that um, that blue Jeep parked three houses away? She's like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I notice it because it's <laughs> never there. <laughs> and it's been there for two days. Why is it there? You know, <laughs> I'll say that. And she goes, you're crazy. I'm not crazy. And a lot of the times I've said that, there was an issue. Maybe it was abandoned or maybe there was an issue. A lot of times I'll be driving home. I see something like that in my neighborhood. I get the phone out. I get a picture. I get the plate. Never know what might happen later. And now I have it. You know, um, you would be surprised when you put a little thought into it, just a regular person, you could do the same thing when things are abnormal. And some some people I've met who have never been in law enforcement. They have good inherent skills. I've seen it and they they have good observation skills and they notice when things are a little different, you know, and people can train themselves that way to improve it. In this day and age, let's be honest, people should. Right. There's a lot of threat. I, I, I totally agree. Do you recommend, no matter how much money somebody makes, you know, whether I'm a fifty thousand dollar person or two hundred thousand dollar executive, do you recommend having cameras around the house, workplace? What are your thoughts on cameras so you can watch yes. it on your phone? And if yes, is there any recommendations you have? So yes, what I would say is this: you should definitely, uh, rather than not, of course, for two reasons. One of them, the most important reason, is a deterrent. You know, people see cameras, bad guys see cameras. They're going to come and maybe see if your door's open in your car, something as small as that. Maybe they're going in to do a burglary during the day. They see cameras. They're going to go to the next house. They're going to go to the next house because they don't have cameras. So I always say you never want to be the softest target on your street. You want to be the hard target. Let them go to the next one. I don't know what to say. Yeah, Too bad for them. What I would also say from practical experience as a detective and in the private sector a lot of times cameras don't, after the fact, a crime has happened, it's not always that easy to use them to identify people. They're not that accurate. Look at today's day and age. People have masks on, right? I mean, it's it's that's a, an obstacle, right? Yeah. So, but the deterrent factor is strong and they can be used to ID people. They are successful in that. As far as the quality, listen, there's a lot of really good systems out there that like simply safe, right? I don't want to throw out brand names, but I will. I mean, little, you don't have to spend a tremendous amount of money right. to have a good system, decent resolution, infrared capability, outside, inside, uh, and, and they're all accessible right on your phone that you can access while you're at work, while you're out to dinner. Awesome. They'll send alarms to them and they're cheap. They're not expensive. So yep. you don't have to spend a lot of money. I, I tell my clients in this business, you have to guard against Companies, they want to sell you the most expensive stuff there is and mark it up. I tell people anything's better than nothing. And a lot of these systems that are very affordable, they're decent. They're, they're good quality. So, so it's interesting what you said. So, so the idea of having the small cameras that nobody sees at a house is not good. You want the camera for the person to know, I have cameras at my house. It's like an announcement you're right. making. You don't want it to be the small ones that nobody sees. Well, I would I would rephrase and just say I like both. I like for deterrent factor, the big ones people can see, but having a covert camera is not a bad idea too. So if they think that they've gotten around, they've they've uh, um, bypassed your camera, maybe they didn't because they don't see the other one. You know, there's so much, there's inside your house too. What if they do get in? Maybe you have a camera in there that's covert that, that's going to pick up on that. That's also based on privacy issues, you know? I've had some clients, they're celebrities. 
they do not want anything Wi-Fi based in their home. They have a fear that someone could tap into that and get video of them in their own home. So you have to you have to um, get the appropriate system for, for the right person, the right client. Very good point. And this is why we have guests like you to get smarter. I feel like in the last 59 minutes, I have become smarter because of you. You know, this is a very educational uh, uh, last hour, and what a story you got! And you know, it, it, before we wrap this up, where where can people find you? Obviously, we're going to put your LinkedIn below. We're going to put all your links on where people find you. But is there a website? Is there one main place where people can find you if they have more questions? That's right, GlobalThreatSolutions.com. That's our company's website. And through that website, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I'll give you all of my uh, social media info and links. But through that website, GlobalThreatSolutions.com, they can find, they can get in touch with not in, not only representatives of my company, but myself. One thing we pride ourselves in, a lot of companies in this industry have got, they get very big, they're corporate and they lose quality. Client has a problem. These are important people, our clients. They're talking to some supervisor or maybe an operations manager. My clients, 24 hours a day, can get me on the phone. And I can tell you it's a big selling point. This is a concierge yeah. service. Like you mentioned before, people are spending a lot of money. They don't want to be talking to a supervisor. When they have a real problem, they want to talk to me. And that's what they get. Well, we're going to put all the links below where people can get a hold of you. And if uh, any questions they have. But with that being said, Kenneth, thank you so much for being a guest on Value Team. And this was wonder wonderful. Thank you. It was great being on the show. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you, buddy. You know, I got to tell you, when the team first brought up his name that, hey, Pat, would you like to interview him? I looked him up. I'm like, there's not a lot on him. I don't know. So I thought about it. I said, let's do it. And I did it. And I just told him right now. I mean, you didn't see it, but I told him privately. I learned a lot. And I'm sure this can be something that anybody who is a civilian can learn a lot from it and apply it. But what a fascinating interview. I got so educated about the whole world. And I hope you did as well. And if you enjoyed this interview, there's another interview I did, which we talked about in the interview. Clint Hill, former Secret Service agent for four presidents, and Jackie Kennedy. It's got a few million views, I think six or seven million views. If you've not watched it, it's a must-watch. Click over to go watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.